Aloha mai kako. You are watching Hawaii Political Reporter. You and I are going to look back and each pick a story or, or theme or element or idea in the zeitgeist of 2013 that we each found most important. And then we'll each look ahead to 2014 to talk about what we're going to pick. Now, audience should know, James and I don't know what each other's picks are going to be as years past. So, James, here we go. I think for my story, I thought about other areas. Of course, o Obama's Oscar for Zero Dark Thirty is kind of a huge one. I think for me, it kind of really showed how the media and the military really, really work hand in hand, especially with the new shiny, happy messiah we have here in the United States. But I think, James, like in the past, we reported probably 2010 about drones. Drones are going to become the thing. A couple of years went by, drones really were the thing. James, you and I began this year. Our very first story of 2013 on New World Next Week was about fiscal false flags and the fiscal cliff theater, the economy. And I dug back into the archives and looked even more. James, you and I first reported on something called Bitcoin back in May of 2011. And that's when I can dig back into the MediaMonarchy.com archives and we'll include all those links for folks. But I think just as we talked about and reported on Bitcoin a couple of years ago, I really think 2013 has turned into the year of Bitcoin. Having said that, I don't think it's about Bitcoin really at, at all or Square or any of those forms. I think it's really about the interview that I did a couple of months ago with, the, with David Wallman the author of the book, The End of Money. And I think that's really what it's about. It's sort of the end of money as we know it. And Bitcoin, for better or worse, has kind of had that effect that it's been said what Napster was to the media, entertainment, industrial complex. Bitcoin will be and could and should be to the banksters that the toothpaste is out of the tube, the genie's out of the bottle, there's no way you can go back. It's only a matter of how we're going to deal with it from here on. A couple of months ago, James, you and I reported on the feds seizing Silk Road online, this drug haven that was using Bitcoin as the currency. And as we even look a little more recently, JP Morgan has now patented some Bitcoin-like payment system. China made an exchange move which sunk Bitcoin's value. And even today, James, Wired reports, who owns the world's largest Bitcoin wallet? The FBI. So again, I, this isn't me saying I'm praising Bitcoin and it's going to be our savior, but I think it's been kind of the thing that, that will shake and will affect and, and has been in 2013 and will continue to be, James. Good call. I like that. That uh, if it was uh, Time Magazine, I guess it would not be the person of the year, but the thing of the year. Yeah, sure. I, I, I agree. I mean, obviously, this has been a breakout year for Bitcoin in particular, but I think you're right. The, the overall trend is more about that end of money idea. The idea that people are now starting to question what money is, where it comes from, how it's created and how we can create it differently. And I think that's generally to the good. Um, obviously, I agree. I don't think Bitcoin is necessarily the savior, but at the very least, it's an alternative and it gets people thinking in, in a different manner. So this has been a wild and wacky year for Bitcoin investors. And uh, so certainly we saw that speculative bubble here in the last couple of months. So, yeah, a very, very big story that's that we've been following, as you say, for a couple of years now. We've been following the trajectory of this and will undoubtedly, I'm sure, continue to follow it into 2014, maybe as it develops uh, different branches and different offshoots um, along that line. Yeah, very good choice. So I think, yeah, a as you see now, the big boys, the big banksters getting involved, I think they're looking at us going, oh, crap, they're starting to kind of fix their own ways around this. And two other notes, James, and I'll, and I'll turn it back over to you. One, I think it's, it's important to note, and again, we'll include this article and coming from our, our friends at blacklistednews.com, celebrating 100 years of failure from the Federal Reserve, their 100th anniversary pretty much uh, about to roll around. And James, Cassie and I were doing some Christmas shopping this past weekend for our families, and so we wanted to do local Made in Oregon things. So there, was, there happened to be a show of all local craftsmen. So we were able to go to this thing, buy local handmade items, and most of them had the little square swipey device. So in my mind, it's like, man, this is the future. 
if we can somehow get around it still being controlled by Visa and PayPal and the banks, we'll be doing a hell of a lot better. But it just really seeing those kind of things, uh, again, James, you and I are talking on video Jetsons phones. It's seeing those things that really make you think it's like the, we're, we're living in the future now. We are, and if only we could open up the source on a lot of this technology, wouldn't that be much better than all of this proprietary software? Well, just one last thing on Bitcoin before we let that go. Um, obviously, uh, as you mentioned, the banksters may be sweating a bit about the idea that people are starting to question money, but maybe not particularly about Bitcoin. Obviously, um, there was that presentation that uh, that one of the, uh, the main Bitcoin proponents made to Inqtel, the CIA's venture, invest, uh, venture capital firm, a couple of years ago, and uh, now the CFR is uh, at least kind of half-heartedly joking about the Bitcoin Bitcoin becoming a replacement for the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. And guess what? There's a, a, a Bitcoin proponent who's going to be making a presentation about Bitcoin, Bitcoin to the CFR in February. So um, maybe they're trying to get in front of this one. Maybe they're already in front of this one. At any rate, we'll leave that there for now. My 2013 story, um, well, I'm, if I have to choose one story that encapsulates this idea, it's more of an idea, but if I had to choose one story, I guess it would be the Boston Marathon bombing, but not because that story in particular was particularly important, but because it represented a theme to me. And that was that this is one of those kind of standard false flag operations that we could have easily seen turn into some sort of geopolitical incident that would have furthered uh, certain pieces along on the geopolitical political chessboard, but we didn't. And I think that's important because I really do believe that there was a, a, a huge input of the alternative media laying the groundwork for people to be very critical of what we were hearing about the Boston Marathon bombing and laying at the very least the, the framework and the vocabulary, the terminology for people to understand the concept of false flag terrorism and that we may not be being told the truth about what's happening. And it was interesting to me to see really as soon as that story hit, all of a sudden, uh, the the internet was being flooded with uh, with the search term false flag. You can look at the the Google whatever they call it, the lexicon thing, where you can see the uh, the number of search terms. False flag just took off through the roof. I had a, a th two or three year old video on false flags that suddenly went re viral as people started uh, searching for this term. So there was a huge uh, uh, surge in interest in that as soon as the Boston Marathon bombing took place and a big kickback. And that was something we saw repeated throughout the year. We saw, for example, the Michael Hastings crash people have immediately started to question that and i saw a huge response to uh to my episode on that one of the biggest episodes i put out this year um and and uh, that, i think it also bore fruit in uh, the lead up to the possible syria military intervention um in the wake of the chemical weapons attack august 21st in Ghouta. All of a sudden, we had huge amounts of people pouring out saying it's it's a lie, um, saying don't go to war, this is just a war for aggression, uh, war for imperial conquest, and it didn't happen. Um, we've seen this happening over and over again this year. It's this it it's a new uh, phenomenon, I think, uh, or at least a different uh, different level of this phenomenon that people are starting to truly question what they hear, and I think. I honestly believe the alternative media has had a huge input in, in getting us to this point. Um, and, and I think it's for the good, obviously. I think this is what we've been striving towards. Of course, I also have a couple of points of caution. But uh, before I move on, perhaps you can just comment on, on the story. Oh, God. Well, I mean, now this, this past year being in a newsroom in the evenings now. So these major stories, whether it was, you know, Sandy Hook, you know, a year ago or the Boston bombing or any of the sort of events that do play out over the course of a few days, because if you remember the Boston bombing story was a whole Monday through Friday mini series, starting with the first event on Monday and ending with the, you know, exciting conclusion late Friday night. And, and again, James, I think what you're talking about, hopefully, that's that's what we've wanted to do in some small way arm people with the sort of discernment that we were talking about last week and the sort of keen eye to things that on the first and second event it might not make sense but when they keep trying these events and these ham-fisted kind of operations newer folks who are now paying attention once they get a few events sort of under their belt under their belt so to speak that they've been watching in intently when they come along more, they're better armed to look at it and go, oh, red flag, red flag, red flag. Okay, I know when these things happen, now I can see these bullet points happen. And, and that's, I remember having those kind of experiences myself kind of early in doing my own 
amateur research, watching stories, and then at some point, I think probably, you know, sitting with my mom in the kitchen where it was when the DC madam died. And I, you know, it talked about, it was like, now, you know, this is a bad thing when they start to roll out the, you know, it even named certain people. And then a little bit later, it was like, oh, there they are on TV. There's Gerald Posner saying, oh, yeah, she really hung herself. So, again, being involved in these events, you're able to, to I think, start to kind of decode them. I think so. So, um, so again, I think it's to the good that this is happening, but I think there are points of caution. You mentioned the key word, which is discernment. And I think we need um, a lot more of that because we, uh, I've thought about this quite a lot recently. What is the end, end point of this um, when people start questioning everything? Good, I'm glad. Everyone, everyone should be questioning everything. But when you uncork that bottle, there's always the possibility that, uh, that people go off the deep end with that. And, uh, and that means that they question everything to the point where they they can't find bedrock anywhere and everything becomes the conspiracy and uh, and they can't find they can't use their discernment to find what's real in this in this world as well so there's there's that question and then there's also the 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 idea that the uh, the 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 kleptocrats the the cryptocrats the, the pathocrats the people who the powers that shouldn't be are not stupid people there are a lot of things but they're not stupid and they understand that this phenomenon is happening and they're going to try to front run it and uh, perhaps they already are and there's all sorts of things for example around the snowden story that make me question you know who is snowden what's what's really behind him who's reporting on this how are they reporting there's a lot of questions that i have about this story that may show that for example the intelligence community is starting to put out out these types of stories that they know will be picked up and interpreted a certain way by the alternative media, perhaps for a different end. I mean, who knows? There's a million different permutations or possibilities, and maybe this is all part of the uh, the revelation of the method and the panopticon and getting us uh, into the control grid. I mean, that's just one of those possibilities that we should be uh, we should also be thinking about because uh, again, uh, I, I think they're going to start trying to use and play the alternative media as it becomes more and more of a presence. So that's my thoughts for 2013, and I'm sure that. It's a trend that will continue into 2014. I, I think you're right. I, I, I think you're right, James. And there's so many points I, I would love to kind of get into there. But I think like like you were saying, it, it can become a psychosis to the point where, yeah, there is no there is no bedrock. And you're, you know, like a friends at tragedy and hope. It's like, dude, now you're not even using your, your three basic, you know, keys of, of learning and how to to think about a story and teach yourself something. So, James, having said all that, let's quickly now look at our thoughts for a trend for 2014. And again, just as I think we're saying, not a, sp a specific story of 2013, but a, an idea, a, a, a move, or a trend. And James, I think in a way, something that I, I've talked about again with, with Cassie, and also something I even talked about again tonight with, with a new coworker and friend, my man Jake, that it's maybe not so much going to be DIY as it is DIO. Instead of do it yourself, it's going to be do it ourselves. And I think in a way, people are going to start to sort of let a lot of things go. And I think people are really going to start to walk away. And, and again, some of this may just be a, a sort of somewhat wishful thinking in the ways you'd like to, I'd like to see things go, that people will really start to walk away from all the failed institutions of churches and banks and schools and stores and jobs and all that crap. And some of it will be for better and some of it will be for worse. But again, I think they'll, in a way, they'll kind of be that severing. And we're going to stop, you know, yelling at Walmart to, well, why don't you do this or that? It's like, it's Walmart. Walk away. Oh, fast food and McDonald's, aren't you raised? No, I, you're not a sustainable part of any part of our lives. I'm, I'm walking away. I'm not looking at that. I, th I think, James, those things hopefully will start to happen. We will do it ourselves. We'll start to make food more in groups. And I think probably a GMO labeling bill will also pass, and, and that'll be a whole other thing. But I think we're going to make our own food with groups. We're going to make our own media with groups more and more and more. And again, it comes with that caveat of, yes, we can do all these things ourselves. Unfortunately, the new mega bosses are now all the internet companies. Comcast has bought Universal. You know, Amazon buys up or invents all the... That has been the main switch. So again, just as we were talking about the 2013 trend, I love that I can 
exchange goods right with that person who hand me that good. I just wish Visa wasn't involved in it. So just as we can all make our own media together more and more and more, I just kind of wish it didn't have to be on a Google Hangout and that we could find some other way around that. That might not really be possible for right now. The other thought is that in some way, I think maybe, hopefully again, maybe the places like Google and Amazon aren't so dastardly, bastardly evil as the evil corporations, whether that's, you know, the, the pharmaceutical corporations or Halliburton and Bayer and all those folks that really do actively want to hurt and kill us. That hopefully in a way the internet companies, whatever, you guys do your thing, bitch about whatever you want. You know, you're doing it on our networks, you know, bitch away, fine. That I think ultimately changes what I'm saying. It's, it's going to be more DIY and more DIO, do it ourselves. Well, James, you've uh, you've shamed me because uh, you've picked an aspirational theme for 2014, where mine is not nearly so hopeful. I certainly hope that it does become more DIY or DIO or some combination of that, and I hope people do start walking away. I, I don't share your optimism about the internet companies. In fact, in some ways, I find them more insidious. But at any rate, I certainly do think that the uh, just the engagement that comes with online culture will at least hopefully prod a few more people in the direction of taking responsibility on for themselves. So I, I applaud you for that idea. I certainly hope that it does come true and more people do start walking away from the monstrosities that we're placed into. Well, and, and, and just as you did note, and I, of course, unfortunately forgot, even as I was r rhapsodizing about all this stuff, oh, that's right, Google is buying up all the military robot companies. So I don't know if they're just going to use them to deliver packages to us like Amazon or worse. Yeah, well, I'm not holding my breath. All right. Okay. Well, I, again, I, I do applaud that. I hope that is some, a trend that will continue and, and accelerate into the new year. Um, my, my new year um, theme trend is not nearly so happy or hopeful, so we should, probably should have started with this one. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the economic uh, side of things, financial. Um, I think that we're setting things up for a very worrying um, 2014 at the, here at the end of uh, 2013 as we're preparing for the changeover of the, uh, the, the pu puppet mouthpiece of the Federal Reserve from Bernanke to Yellen. I'm not sure that will be much of a change of anything, really, in terms of policy, but it will at any rate be a, a changeover point. And here we are at, uh, to, at the start of this QE tapering and uh, the markets in the last uh, day or two going crazy. Oh, yay. Oh, tapering. Oh, wonderful. Look at the stock market taking off. Everything's peachy keen. I really do see this as, uh, as, as a very worrying time because uh, I think this is the potentially at least the beginning of the bursting of another bubble that has been blown up since the 2008 collapse. So uh, uh, these bubbles keep getting inflated and keep popping. So I'm I'm worried about that trend. Mm -hmm. I think there are other financial trends that are developing. Australia just took the reins of the G20 and apparently they're going to use their uh, their 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 presidency of the G20 to argue for uh, global taxation, and of course they're framing this in the in terms of uh, oh global uh, plugging loopholes and leaks on on corporate taxes. Um, but I think this is really just again just part of the foundations of the global taxation and regulation system that and structures that they're trying to bring in. Um, I don't think global government is going to arrive fully formed in 2014. I think we're just going to be another step along forward down that process. And so a couple of worries trends and things in developing in financial and economic and geo geoeconomic uh, uh, relations and uh, again uh, if if that is counteracted by the dio mentality and we we start uh, banding together to to get off of the the corporate global enslavement grid then then to a certain extent who cares what they do and what they do with their funny money etc if we do find alternatives and ways of doing things ourselves so let's counteract my bad trend with your good trend and hope for the best in 2014 prepare for the worst and uh, do our best to make it a better world once again. You, as a free, beautiful, independent human being with inalienable rights, own yourself. As a result, you can do what you want with your own body and own the product of your labor. The implication is that it is morally wrong to initiate force against someone else or their property because to do so is to violate their rights. Therefore, all human interactions should be free of force, fraud, and coercion, and people should be free to exercise their rights, limited only by respect for the rights of others. When you learned don't hit and don't steal, it wasn't unless you work for the government. When you learned thou shalt not kill, it wasn't unless your dear leader gives you a gun and a uniform and a one-way ticket to the other side of the world. Government is force, an opinion with a gun, and force is a poor substitute for persuasion. 
Governments frighten us into thinking we need them, but with knowledge, philosophy, and technology, we are empowering ourselves and each other to have the courage to move past the paradigm of statism and restrain government to only moral uses of force, at least until we replace it with the cooperative free market solutions that will soon render it obsolete. The Congress believes uh, mysteriously that it has gotten itself and the federal government out of the economic woes that it and its predecessor Congresses have visited on the federal government by agreeing to borrow more money with ever, without ever agreeing to pay it back. Woodrow Wilson started all this out off about 100 years ago when he borrowed $30 billion to pay for World War I. At the time, the debt of the federal government was $14 billion, so overnight he trebled it from $14 billion to $45 billion. The government this week decided that it would get itself out of its economic woes by not putting a ceiling on the amount of borrowing and basically giving the President of the United States a blank check to exceed $17 trillion in debt. The $17 trillion is an almost unimaginable number. It's almost incomprehensible what that amount of cash would look like. It would fill several football stadiums, even if they were in $100 bills. But beyond that, the concept of debt is utterly destructive because it has to be paid back. And it's not paid back by the government. It's paid back by individual taxpayers. The people that the government owes money to are not going to come and seize government property. The government is going to unleash its tax collectors, excuse me, its debt collectors on the rest of us. The IRS will seize our property if we don't pay in a timely manner. Debt is utterly destructive because it causes us to spend our prosperity to pay for ancient debts. Right now, the federal government collects about two and a half trillion in revenue. Half a trillion is spent on paying debt. Right now, the federal government borrows about 1.2, 1.3 trillion a year. That is half as much as it collects in revenue. So the government is utterly addicted to debt and it never pays it back. You see, the 30 billion that Woodrow Wilson borrowed to fund World War I, we are still paying back. And the money that Barack Obama has borrowed, six trillion so far during his presidency, now another trillion and a half in just the next uh, three or four months, will never be paid back. The bill will get bigger. More of our wealth and prosperity will go to pay back the people that loaned that money to the federal government, and the spiral will continue. At some point, the debt burden will be so great that it will actually be cheaper for individuals not to work and pay income taxes, but rather to be supported by the government. Does that sound apocalyptic? Well, 47% of Americans already don't work and are supported by the government, and they vote. When that number reaches greater than 50, it's a tipping point. Debt destroys and the government just keeps adding to the debt and to the destruction of our prosperity. Just recently, there was a vote canceled in the U.S. Congress. And the reason why it was canceled is it lost support. The president has been very anxious these last several months. Matter of fact, last couple of years, he's been very much involved in fighting the war to oust Assad in Syria and supporting the rebels. It's become known that the rebels are made up of Al-Qaeda and a lot of radicals, and yet we've been on the side of the Al-Qaeda. Well, uh, the president said that he wanted to do more to help remove Assad by bombing that country and helping Al-Qaeda. But the people woke up, heard this message, and, and rejected this idea. The president claimed he had the authority to do it without congressional approval, but decided because he was getting a lot of negative press over this, that he would take it to the Congress and, uh, and get a vote. But in the meantime, the support uh, for this just uh, disintegrated. There was no support for this, and he was forced to cancel this vote. But this is significant in the fact that American people, if they speak out and let the government know and let the president know, they will have to change policy. And now, especially in the last 10 years, matter of fact, even since World War II, we've never declared war. The presidents just do whatever they want. 
And this is the first time in recent history where the American people spoke up and actually stopped a bombing from happening. And yet there's a lot of individuals in Washington around the country, the neoconservatives who are anxious to get rid of Assad, regardless of the fact that they will end up with a country more messed up than ever, just as we have done in Afghanistan and in, uh, in Iraq. But going into Syria right now, their plan was to march then on to Iran and uh, change the government in Iran. But it's very, very exciting to realize that this vote was canceled. This is one of the most important non-votes in, in foreign policy that we've had in a long, long time. And it's a result of the public opinion going against the president and reigning in the president because the president does not have authority to do this. Matter of fact, in the last several years, the presidents have assumed that uh, they can get authority elsewhere. They don't need congressional authority. They can get it from the United Nations or from NATO, which is absolutely wrong and one of the reasons why we get involved in these wars. So I was very pleased that this happened. I just hope the momentum continues. But right now, the neoconservatives are on the defensive. They have been uh, set back a bit. They are trying to rally and get the uh, war-mongering spirit alive again. But right now, we as Americans should all be very pleased that the bombing did not occur in Syria. And hopefully, this will bring common sense to the way we treat Iran and that we start talking to them, which the president has agreed to do, instead of just assuming that the only solution for our international concerns have been through war. This, to me, is a good sign. We've all heard of the chain of command. Usually people think of the term in the context of military, corporate, and government power structures. But in reality, all of modern society is implicated. The chain of command sounds powerful, and it imbues the officers, the bureaucrats, and the petty dictators of the world with a sense of importance and rank. The term is deceptive, and behind it is an open secret, hiding in plain sight. Power does not flow from the person who administers orders. A command is inconsequential if it's ignored or laughed at. Obedience is the real foundation of misplaced power. It is in fact the chain of obedience, not the chain of command. The cumulative force of cowardly and compliant citizenry which allows evil men to take control. Can you imagine how Napoleon Bonaparte would be treated today if he arrived in Times Square, New York and attempted to order a man put to death? Chances are he'd probably end up heavily medicated in a padded room by the end of the day, but for a few minutes, people would probably have a good laugh. And rightly so. Separated from those who've been trained to obey them, even the most bloody heads of state are hardly more dangerous than a pickpocket or a mugger. It may be true that we have a demented pack of inbred maniacs running the world right now, but they aren't the ones that I fear. I fear the conditioned masses which would put me to death with the drop of a hat if the right order is given. I fear the herd of well-meaning idiots which believe that written law and authority is to be followed at all cost, even at the expense of self-evident morality. The death squads and the concentration camps of history were never staffed by rebels and dissidents. They were run by those who followed the rules. The problem isn't the chain of command. The problem is the chain of obedience. You sick agenda, we know you know you enter.
by American composed American Constitution. 1913, corrupt in the system. DW dollar, hyperinflation. The Federal Reserve, controlled by Lucifer. <laughs> He can't see you lying